My name is Diane Douglas. I'm the executive director of City Club in Seattle. And we're really very, very pleased to bring you this program tonight and to be partners with the University of Washington. And now it's a great pleasure to introduce a friend um, and mentor for me, um, Monica Guzman. Monica craves conversation and seeks out technology that makes it easy, far-reaching, and good. She helps startups and media better understand, engage, and grow their communities. She has helped City Club very much grow um, our community as a former board member of City Club, and we just won't and can't let her go. Um, this fall, she joined the team at GeekWire as a part-time columnist on issues of uh, digital life. She um, previously, most recently, spent a year helping Seattle-based startup Intersect launch and develop an innovative time and location-based storytelling platform. From January 2000 to May 2010, Maya was a reporter at the SeattlePI.com where she ran the experimental and award-winning big blog and drew a community of readers and non and nonstop online conversation um, and casual weekly meetups. She's been named one of the top 100 women in Seattle tech one of the Pointer Institute's 35 social media influencers, and one of the Society of Professional Journalists, Quill Magazine's 20 journalists to follow on Twitter. Please help me in welcoming Monica Guzman. Um, okay, microphone works. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks to Diane. Thanks to everybody who helped put this together. Um, I'm really, I've been looking forward to this just for a long time. Um, Maya Nista Smith is really just one of those people that you go, wow, okay, cool. Um, first of all, I just want to see a show of hands, actually. Who here is in the millennial generation, 1980 or later, or maybe 82, it depends on who you ask. Who's not? Okay, so we, we've got a mix here. We've got a mix. Um, so Maya, the thing about Maya is that she's, in a way, she's been on the edge of things her whole career. And it's been about 10 years. Um, she started when she was 17. She was over at Rock the Vote, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and you helped, I think, register 30,000 voters um, as the coordinator for the East Coast. And in the intervening years, just kept on engaging, kept on figuring out how do you get people involved in their communities, how do you get people involved in civic life. Um, won lots of awards, got lots of acclaim. But for the last six years, you've been involved with mobilize.org, and she's now the CEO. So she's been doing all kinds of cool stuff with that. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna talk about what it is to be young right now, what it is to be civically engaged when so much has changed from the way that we communicate to just the way that we socialize. So I'd like to invite Maya up here with me. Thank you so much for inviting me, and it's such a pleasure to be here in Seattle. Um, so first of all, uh, you just came from another trip. Uh, this was in New York, where Mobilize.org held the Millennial Leadership Summit. And there were more than 100 millennials um, speaking and talking about what it is to just engage young people. And Mobilize.org's mission is, as I understand it, to empower, um, empower young people to implement changes that do good in the world. So first of all, I mean, when you were 17, you know, you already started on this path. And when you left college, you were already kind of knee deep in this world. And a lot of people leave college and still don't really know what they want to do. What inspired you to go down this path that you've gone down? It's a great question. Uh, and for me, uh, I, it, it started before I was born. I'm a first generation American. And my parents immigrated here from Romania. They uh, fled the country. Um, there's, there's a great story. In, uh, that, I, that became sort of folklore in my family. Uh, my mom went to sleep one night. She was a journalist in Romania, which meant in 79 she was a communist journalist. And my father was a professor of architecture. And she went to sleep one night and had this really vivid dream of this little girl wearing purple pants playing on a pra playground. And so, um, you know, as ha someone who's having just been married and thinking about the, the future family, that sort of fills me with, with a great sense of pride and excitement. But Oops, sorry. sorry. Um, uh, it, it filled my mom with a, 
um, a great sense of fear because she realized that the rights and opportunities and freedoms that she had dreamed for the family she would once have would or someday have would not be possible in Romania. And so she had this great dream of me playing on a playground wearing purple pants. And she woke up the next morning and said to my father, we need to go to America, yeah. right? And so I'm sure it was a much longer process than that. But growing up, I had this deep gratitude for the rights and opportunities and freedoms that we had in this country. And, and I think your Twitter profile says that you're creating your American dream and enabling others to do the same, right? Yeah, and that's certainly what I feel gifted to do. Um, I. Uh, my, and, and so, so I grew up with this deep appreciation, and then I went to college in New Jersey, and my first day of college was September 11th, 2001. Wow. I was like, okay, like I get it, <laughs> universe, you're trying to tell me something. <laughs> so um, I realized that my job was to build communities, to um, cross boundaries, and to really empower this generation to understand the full potential uh, that we had and the change that we could make. Earlier today, you well, you've been doing all kinds of things here in Seattle. Actually, could you sum up the last couple of days, some of the things you've done? Yeah, it's been a whirlwind. And, and thank you, Diane, and, and, and the Seattle City Club and the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for bringing me here and packing my schedule with such amazing things. Yesterday, we started with an ed board at the Seattle Times. And I was so excited to see their team there really thinking about how, uh, how millennial coverage in media should be increased, how student <coughs> voice should be thought of in terms of including and in, in being included in community decisions. Um, and then I had the privilege of joining Diane and her family for dinner, mm -hmm. which I very much appreciated. It was a little bit of home. My mom was asking me if I was being fed in Seattle, and the mm -hmm. answer was yes. Oh, and um, Maya lives in DC, by the way. I do we have in DC. That. Um, and then this morning, uh, I uh, went toe to toe with Jean Anderson from uh, King and had a really great interview with her uh, that's going to air in early December, where we talked about, again, the power and potential of this generation, particularly around the 2012 election. Mm -hmm. Had lunch with the trustees at the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, had a really robust conversation, and then this uh, this event caps off my time in Seattle, and so I'm really excited to be with you tonight and hope hope that Monica and I can really make this an interactive conversation and include your questions and ideas, and um, it's really a privilege to get to work for and with this generation and would love to hear from those of you that are millennials in the room, and for those that aren't, uh, would, would love to hear from you anyway. <laughs> Um, so when you were with Jean Anderson, uh, at some point you tweeted, and of course I'm going back to Twitter because what I do, um, you tweeted, filming an interview with King TV here in Seattle. My thesis, millennials are doing big things, listen to them. I'm a one-note Nancy. <laughs> You're a one-note Nancy. Why are millennials so special? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and I think, so I think every gener there's this great Thomas Jefferson quote that every generation needs a revolution, right? So I'm not... Um, I believe in the power of this generation. We're the largest generation in history. We're the most diverse generation in history. We're the, uh, the, the tech savvy, uh, the tech savviness of this generation. We're the first always connected generation, right? The repercussions of that are still. My iPhone's right here. Yeah, right? Still unknown. And um, I was joking today at lunch that like my kids are probably going to have like superhuman thumb strength, mm -hmm. right? Or something, some evolutionary trait but f that, that's going to develop. Um, so there's all these amazing things about the the um, opportunities that are facing this generation. But we also sort of experiencing a perfect storm. On the other side, this generation is the first generation in history that's going to be paying our own student loans back as we put our kids through college. <coughs> right? The average debt load is approaching 20 with 7,000 per person. The, the tuition rates have increased three times what they were in 1980. And millennials are struggling right now with their careers, right? Yeah, the unemployment rate is at historic highs. And I think, um, so I think we're, we're at this moment of challenge and great opportunity. And I think the characteristics of this generation, the resiliency and the persistence and entrepreneurialism and collaboration, I think we're going to see some really amazing things as we re redefine institutions. So why, why focus? Um, is there anything different about this generation in its youth? as opposed to other generations in their youth when it comes to civic engagement? Or is it always that the young people are, are just to be paid attention to? Or is this one particularly? Yeah, and I would, I would love any devil's advocate uh, conversations. I think this generation is particularly unique. I think the tools that w with which we engage, the redefinition, you know, if civic engagement is engaging your community, mm -hmm. the redefinition of community for this generation, the online, offline, the transiency of this generation. My parents, uh, you know, statistically had two jobs over their lifetime. You and I are going to have 17 jobs over our lifetimes, right? So where we find home, where we 
uh, the, the pe places we, you know, build community around are changing. And so I think because of that, civic engagement is changing and the way that we engage with our elected officials, with decision making structures, mm -hmm. with one another it is really different. But I would say on the other side of that, each generation innovates in engagement in their own way. So with mobilize.org, you work on encouraging, uh, you call it millennial driven solutions. Mm -hmm. So tell us about that. What is a millennial driven solution? How is that different and why do we want more of those? Yeah, so we, um, Mobilize has been around for 10 years. We've done a number of things over those 10 years. And in 2007, we started hearing from the young people that we worked with that they were sick of being talked to as if they were the future leaders instead of being recognized for the immense capacity that they had to impact change today. And so we said, these young people are ready, prepared, and able to lead. Um, how can we support them in that? So we created these convenings. They're, they're called summits and they're three-day convenings where we bring young people together to talk about the unique issues that they face, work collaboratively to propose solutions, and then compete for funding to implement those solutions. And so we funded 46 millennial-led projects on issues ranging from increasing community college completion to the challenges facing our returning millennial veterans. And so we believe that young people are uniquely positioned to address the problems that they face in their communities. And if there's two, if there's two lessons that I've learned in, in my 11 years working in this field and in, in being a millennial is that, you know, we don't ask young people enough about what challenges they're facing and what ideas they have to fix them. Tapping into the innovation and creativity of this generation is a, a clear way to address some of the biggest challenges our society is facing. And you mentioned, as one of the challenges I imagine of the generation is, we, we move around a lot, we change jobs more often, um, and we have, you know, not to mention all this bombardment of information coming our way, we probably you know, read way more and just look at way more um, and examine way more and are exposed to way more. So what happens to engagement and the strategies of engagement and mobilization when, when this generation is just, and not just this generation, really everyone, right. our attention is everywhere. We're constantly moving, constantly shifting. What do we, what do we keep with us that can be tapped mm -hmm. to, to, to mobilize us? Yeah, so I think things happen much more quickly now. Um, I, think, I think organizations are being forced to adapt modes of communication that they may not be comfortable with. There's this, you know, when I speak to uh, boomer audiences or greatest generation audiences, they say to me, is this social media thing really here to stay? And I'm like, yeah, you know, it is. And there's this great, there's this great uh, story that I heard from a, a gentleman named Sean Standard Stockton, who's a great philanthropy blogger. And he talks about, um, you know, 80 years ago, we were going about our business writing letters, right? You were an employee, you wrote letters to get your business done. And then the phone came along. And they were like, there is absolutely no way you're going to have time to make those phone calls because you're so busy writing those letters, stamping those envelopes, and sending them off. And somehow we figured out how to use the phone, right? Then the fax machine came around, and they were like, this is silly. You're not going to have time to fax, right? You're, so, you're on the phone, you're writing these letters. But somehow we started faxing. And then the computers came along, and some of you remember, there were these big, ridiculously sized machines that people were like, this is going to be, this is a niche thing. This is not going to, you know, there's never going to be a computer mm -hmm. on every desk in America. And somehow we figured that out. And so social media is just the next generation of communication. And so I think, um, I think the speed at which communication is happening, the, the um, expectancy that we have to always have information at our fingertips mm -hmm. is really challenging nonprofits and elected officials and political parties to relate in a way that's much more authentic, it's much more transparent, and I think that's a really, really good thing. And there's a always a lot of talk about how media is changing and how social media is becoming media because it seems like a lot of the ways that we learn, you know, what's going on in the world around us is through sources we trust. And it used to be that, you know, there was media and newspapers in your town and that was the source you trusted. And now we have this way to access each other that's unprecedented. And we trust our friends. Mm -hmm. um, how does that impact, I mean, social media, clearly, but, but how is that shifting the ways that, that we uh, identify ourselves and identify with causes yeah, I, so I think social media is making it much more easy. The, the, the problem right now with social media that we're facing is it's really hard to measure, right? So in the 2008 election, you had everyone put up like buttons about that they voted or what candidate they're supporting. How, and, and the statistic is that when you put up something on your Facebook page, an average of 50 other people will see it, hmm. right? And 
uh, and I, I imagine that's increased now uh, in the boom of Facebook, but what that actually means for how that relates to offline engagement is a really interesting challenge. But I think, I think one of the things, w you, you use the peer pressure system of Facebook and of Twitter and of these blogs where you're like, everyone on my Facebook page voted today, right? And they're all asking me, did you vote? I'm getting buzzed in my pocket because Monica tweeted, did you vote, <laughs> right? And it becomes much harder to, in to ignore, and I think that's a really good thing. Um, so, so that's just one way that I would say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you have to kind of make sure that you get, I guess, um, th that you are in that conversation that people are sharing with each other. And you were talking about authenticity, and that's where that really comes in, right? Yeah, I'm always struck by people who are like, I have a personal Facebook, and then I have an organizational Facebook. Right. And you're like, well, that's not, that's not the way to build a community around the work that you care about, right? Like, my birthday was, was in October, and I've maybe 2,500 Facebook friends. And so I started a Facebook cause on, uh, uh, for Mobilize.org. And I said, it's my birthday. Please join me in supporting Mobilize. And I raised hundreds of dollars from people who I had never met in person because they had watched me develop this narrative with them online where they were like, Maya does really amazing work. And Mobilize takes her away from her husband a lot. And she's doing really important stuff for the millennial generation. So I'd like to contribute. And I'll donate 10 or 20 or $50. And so you build ties with people um, that, that you'd nev you know, never met in person, and I think that's so important. And people always worry about you know, the internet safety and all of these different things, and I think those are valid claims, but I wouldn't, you know, if, if this gentleman picked me up from the airport, I wouldn't get in his car, <laughs> right? So just uh, now I would, right? Now you can <laughs> take him to the airport tomorrow if you'd like. Um, but, but so I think it's a basic just carefulness that, that people are throwing out the window online sometimes. Mm -hmm. And how about, and I'll bet you've heard this argument before, because I sure have, saying that, oh, well, now you know, people can like a cause on Facebook mm -hmm. and think that they're being active, yeah. that that's enough, that that's civic engagement. They've done their part. Yeah, so you've, I mean, you've never talked to a millennial if you think that's the case, right? Because we're liking things on Facebook. We made up half of all real-life volunteers last year, according to the Corporation for National and Community Sur study, uh, Service, um, were, uh, we are, are showing up in really big ways for our communities. What I'll say, though, is we're showing up in a different way. Millennials aren't engaging in episodic volunteerism, right? We're not waking up every Saturday and cleaning a river. We want to find out why this river is polluted, hmm. right, and get to the source so that we can sleep late on Saturdays or do something else, right? And so I think we're looking at systemic change in our actions uh, across the board. What lessons do you think that millennials should learn from other generations about civic engagement? And what lessons do you think that other generations should be learning from millennials? Yeah, and, and first I would say we need to learn more lessons from each other, period. Yeah. Right? I think the value of intergenerational dialogue is something that we don't emphasize enough. The fact, and, and I think I'll if you don't mind, I'll speak for you. I think the fact that Monica and I are, speak, are sitting here, right, as first-generation Americans, as women leaders, respect in our communities, is, be, is because of the movements that have come before us, right? Like, we didn't, we didn't fight this fight on our own. And, and so we're standing on the, giant, on the shoulders of giants, and we need to have an appreciation for the context of the work that we do. On the other side, people need to view millennials as useful beyond helping them set up a Facebook page, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and so I think there needs to be a little more, um, a little more intergenerational understanding. And I think um, understanding the context of the movements that we work in. The, the other big thing, this, so this generation, millennials, are of all the generations closest to their parents, right, in, in terms of like, Relationship? Uh, attachment. Oh, interesting. Relation but then also, six out of every ten millennials are financially responsible for their parents, right? So the economic condition wow. across generations is, has taken a huge, huge hit. Mm -hmm. And as a young person who's financially responsible in part for, for my parents, I realized that this isn't a millennial issue. It's not a boomer issue. There was an amazing, there was an interesting Wells Fargo uh, survey that came out today that said the average retirement age is probably going to need to go from 65 to 80. But the life expectancy is 78. So you're going to owe two years after you're dead, <laughs> which is just this most, de awesome. this most devastating thing because the average boomer has only saved 7% of what they need for retirement, right? So, so this, uh, today, the, t the times that we live in make intergenerational conversation and dialogue and partnership and mentorship so much more crucial. And, and we try and play a small role in that in terms of the work that we do, but I encourage other organizations, 
millennial organizations and organizations serving other populations to really explore how they can bring these conversations mm -hmm. together. How have you seen that happen in ways that work? Because that is tough. I mean, you can start just by the technological differences, and sometimes that's enough to drive people apart and just say, I don't understand, you know, why you even have that phone, or I don't understand this or that. How have you seen that work? Where are there intergenerational conversations? Yeah, so I, th I think the best examples that we're seeing right now are in the volunteering space. So there's a great organization called uh, Points of Light that is um, doing both work with senior core and civic ventures, and then they just launched an initiative called Generation On that focuses on like the five to 21 year old set. And so mm -hmm. they are creating the spectrum of engagement opportunities from the youngest to the oldest volunteers to share in improving their communities. I think in terms of the civic engagement space, it doesn't happen as much in an organized way, but if you, I mean, if you guys know of an example here in the room or online, I'd love to hear it because that is a question that I often get, so, mm -hmm. so hold on to that. But yeah, so I would say the volunteering space has, has gotten it right and we need to do a better job of creating those safe spaces where you can say, hey, like, what are you always doing on your phone? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are you mm -hmm. getting out of that? And we can show them that it's not, uh, you know, that we can actually multitask, right? Mm -hmm. And that we mm -hmm. are actually listening to you and we can pay attention and yep. all of those things. So going back to the power that millennials kind of represent and what they can do, and I think that's kind of where we started and something that you really talk a lot about. Um, we talked a little bit about this just before we started. Um, Thomas Bates and Thomas Goldstein, um, uh, mobilizers here in Washington State. Um, who, who was it Bates that was involved with Washington Bus? And Goldstein. The other way around. Goldstein involved with Washington Bus and uh, Bates involved with Rock the Vote. Uh, and they wrote uh, like a piece in the Seattle Times back in March um, where they talked about what is this, what is this tendency uh, in campaigns that they saw where they, they basically don't invite young people and then they wonder why they didn't show up. Why didn't they show up to the polls? Mm -hmm. um, and they show that you know, this is an investment market. Like you said, it's going to be it's the largest generation. By 2015, it'll be a third of the voting electorate. Um, you know, we've got the next presidential election coming up. This last presiden presidential election, young people made a huge difference. Um, so what advice would you have for people, you know, in campaigns, not just in politics, but all kinds of civic life, to take millennials seriously or to learn from them? It's a great question. And I think, and I think the basic thing is to ask yourself, are you engaging millennials, right? Do you have young people involved in the work that you do from the beginning? So I'm, I'm sure many people in this room share the the experience of being sort of a last minute addition because they needed more young people or more diverse faces in the room and 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 how you can build those authentic opportunities for me, for engagement from the beginning I think is so important um, I would also say that it's a continued effort right what we saw in 2008 was this uh, the, the first time in history when all the presidential campaigns had youth vote coordinators mm -hmm. and then in 2010 it's like they forgot what was successful in 2008. And you need mm -hmm. to continue paying attention and engaging this generation in authentic ways and tapping into the communication tools that we're innovating on. And so um, I, think it's, I think it's really just, are, are you, do you have opportunities to authentically engage young people in the work that you do? Mm -hmm. Are you surrounded by young people who are giving you advice? I, I mean, I gave a speech uh, a couple months ago that the topic of it was, are young people interested in serving, right? And, and I saw that and I was just like, I could say yes and then go home, right? And so this generation is eager to engage. It's eager to get involved in their, in their communities. It's eager to take on leadership opportunities. Um, and we just need to make sure that we're preparing our institutions for their leadership. Um, another thing that happened back in March, and this goes back to politics, William O'Brien, um, state senator in New Hampshire, gave a speech where he said that these, these are kids, there are kids voting liberal, they're voting their feelings because they have no life experience. And he said that in a video that went viral um, in defense of a bill that had been proposed that would eliminate same day registration, voting day registration, um, and also make it mandatory, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that you have to state your residency in the state where you are. Uh, and the, the idea was, this seems a little bit targeted to students. What's going on there? And this is something that's been talked about states all over the country. Um, what do you make of that? What would be your answer to that? And w first, I'll ask, actually, how do you understand that sentiment 
oh, they're young, they're liberal, they don't know what they're talking about. Is it really, can it really be such a blanket statement? Is there some truth to it? Yeah, so I'll take it in three parts. We're young, mm -hmm. right? I can't, I can't really argue with that. We're liberal. In 2008, we voted two to one Democrat, this generation. But Pew Foundation, uh, the Pew study um, shows that in reality, the majority of this generation has declined to state or independent, sort of rejecting the two-party system and saying that neither work for me and, and trying to find an alternative, mm -hmm. whether it's third party or revitalizing uh, the current party. So I, I would say that it, it's, it's an incorrect statement to say that this generation is liberal. Um, and then I think they don't know what they're talking about is just offensive, <laughs> right? Like, I, um, I think young people need to be appreciated for the experience that they bring. The challenges that we face are real, right? We're not, like, pretending to be unemployed, mm -hmm. right? I'm mm -hmm. not, like, pretending to pay my student debt every month. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, although I guess some people <laughs> are, the default rate has mm -hmm. gone up very, mm -hmm. but yeah, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, if I could find a way to pretend not to pay my loans, I would. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, first, th this, these, it's sort of an inevitable thing that these young people are, are going to and are leading institutions, leading our democracy, leading our communities. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you would negate an entire generation mm -hmm. is just, it's, it's offensive and I would, I think that. Or uh, even just the ones that are in school, right? Because yeah, I guess their argument right? is they're students, they're not you know, even supposed to be working right now, so they don't really know what they're yeah. doing. And I mean, let's be honest, people who don't know what they're talking about would be like me talking about high school. Right? In two weeks, I'm going to my 10-year high school reunion. Um, I have no idea what high school is like now. Absolutely no idea. And so if I want to talk about the education system, I'm going to find some students. I'm not going to sort of wax philosophical on high about what the education system needs, right? And so as an elected official representing a community, representing the education and the safety and the, mm -hmm. all these parts of a community, you need to value the opinions of the people that are, make it up. And so um, it seems like such a basic public service principle to me, and I was glad to see the uproar that happened w with the video. And yeah, and, and what's happened since, by the way? D d have you seen kind of, what, what's been the update to those? Are, are those initiatives, those proposals still still going? Do you feel like this is still kind of a battle to be waged? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the states around the country, there's many, and, and Mobilize is a nonpartisan organization, but there's definitely threats to civic participation in New Hampshire around the country, and so this is not, uh, th these fights are, are far from over, and new ones pop up every day. On the other side, issues get resolved every day, too, and so I think this is the ongoing push and pull of a democracy mm -hmm. that we're trying to build, and I think, you know, again, as the daughter of immigrants, like, I think, I think that's the beautiful part of it, and so um, I, uh, I encourage it, and I'm, I'm hopeful by the wins and, and sort of uh, incited by the losses. So you live in D.C., I live here in Seattle, and both cities are considered really great cities for young people because of their culture, because of their industries, um, you know, because of the sort of entrepreneurial spirits that they draw and people kind of working for good. But what, is, what are the challenges then about, say, engaging in rural areas as opposed to you know, big cities where everybody just kind of flocks for certain reasons? Um, how, how do you, when it's so easy to get everybody kind of split up and divided you know, online or through the media that they like, the sources they trust, can, I mean, can you even talk about the generation being one in a way? Yeah, so I think, I think in a lot of ways we do ourselves a disservice by painting this generation in these broad brush strokes, right? Because it's, again, it's the most diverse generation in history in every definition of the word. And so um, we uh, at Mobilize launched this initiative called Target 2020 to make the United States the most competitive country in terms of degree attainment, again, as a way to reduce generational poverty. And so we were working on community college campuses in California and North Carolina. It, North Carolina is an extremely rural state, mm -hmm. and in that, in that state, we found that the educational issues were about access, right? It was about, I, I'm not close to a campus. I'm driving 45 minutes 
to get a degree because there's not options closer to where I live, right? And then in California, they built a community college every month for a decade. And so there it's an issue of success. And so what we're finding is that the issues, even within a population, right, community college students in this country are so different regionally in terms of urban populations, rural populations. And so we try and do our best to ask the young people in those areas, what do you need, mm -hmm. right? I don't pretend to know what it's like to live in Asheville, North Carolina and try and and, and, and work to get my um, BA. So you tell me what you need mm -hmm. and Mobilize serves as a resource to those young people at whatever level they are in whatever way they want to make change. And part of what you do, I, I, I think, is also take that data and put it out in reports just to help everybody else understand the yeah. generation. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think part of what are, what, so the thing I love best about my job is being a resource, having the opportunity to talk about this generation. I think the second part of my job is using the access that I have to ensure that other young people are telling their stories. So whether it's through our data, through our website, through our programs, through the ideas that we fund, we're empowering young people whose voices are least rarely heard to say, I'm a leader, my voice is valued, and I can make a difference in my community. And so from issues like peer mentoring in North Carolina to veterans doing international disaster relief, I, I could talk for days about the stories of the, the amazing young people in whom we've invested. So switching gears a bit, uh, this is the finale of City Club's Community Matters campaign. Um, now I've been to, I had the good fortune of attending a Community Matters uh, discussion. And what it is, is it's, it's a campaign where um, City Club representatives kind of go and g there's gatherings of people and you start to talk about your neighborhood, the way you live your life. Where is it that you feel connected? Where is it that you don't? And you start to become aware of sort of the opportunities that exist for people to get more involved in their own communities. And then City Club ends up learning a lot of really cool stuff about what people want to see more of, what would make them come out more and make them get more involved, and what would ultimately make our communities better. So this year, um, we've got some preliminary results of the campaign. It's not quite you know, officially out, but, um, but Diane and, and Jessica were telling me um, about there's two very interesting things that came out of the discussions this year. Um, things that people kind of want to see more of when it comes to civic engagement. I wanted to talk about the, both of them with you, see what you thought. Um, and one of them is this idea of followership. Now, when I, when I first heard the word followership, I was like, Twitter followers? Facebook followers? No, but that's not it. That's probably not what they're talking about. And it's not what they're talking about. Um, it's this idea that we live in a time where everybody is encouraged to lead. And leading is a wonderful thing. You know, when you think of entrepreneurial spirit and everything, it's like, be yourself, go get your thing done, make your vision happen. And that's great. But if we were all leaders, who's following? How do the movements get built? And I thought this was such a captivating idea that came out in these discussions, people going, we feel like somehow in our civic discourse and maybe in our politics, there's a lack of this sense of followership where Maybe politicians appear to be in kind of nonstop, constant campaign mode. And they're always thinking about, well, I've got, to, I've got to win the next one. And then you might hear politicians say that because they don't support whoever's in charge, you know, they hope things go badly just so that you know, this guy can get booted out. So tell me about that idea, about followership. Is this something that you think millennials can really grasp? even while we're in such a, such a phase of empowerment and go do it on your own, and we've got 17 jobs, and how, how is that going to play a role? Is that something coming up? So I've been thinking a lot about this. I had the privilege of hearing the American Express CEO, Ken Chenault, to talk about followership and the, that he looks at all of his leaders as who they're able to influence, mm -hmm. right? And so I think of followership, not, nobody wakes up and says, like, who am I going to follow today, <laughs> right? So, so I think it's sort of a misnomer in terms of, and what I think it's more of is influencers, right? Who are the influencers that you pay attention to in media, in culture, in academia? And so I think, um, I think it, so we believe that every young person should be a leader and take responsibility for improving their corner of the world. Um, but then there's also this collective power that we need to move somewhere together. What's great, I think, about our generation is that we're not waiting for an for, for one person to make that possible for us. There's this great Huffington Post blog by this 31-year-old veteran from Penn State who was talking about how he was disillusioned with the leadership that he was always waiting to have come, right? To mm -hmm. that, and, and, and through that disillusionment, he realized that 
it was actually him, right? That 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 great quote about we're the le leaders we've been waiting for. And so I I would actually respectfully push back about the idea of followership, at least in the language, because I just think it's it's a disempowering way to think about social change and the huge expectation that's placed on all of us to, to improve the world around us. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think of, I think it was 2006 where Time Magazine announced that you were the person of the year. Everyone remember that? There's a lot of kind of making fun of that. But it does go to show, I mean, wouldn't it be awesome if we did find a way to be our own leaders, to have a network that, you know, where we all felt our voices were heard, but you could still build movements. And, and I think, I, I, think I, I may agree with you a little bit that we're still OK on that front. I mean, that it's incredible what you build, what we can all build together just in the ways that we're connected. Um, the second thing that came out of uh, the Community Matters campaign that people thought was something important they wanted to see was compassionate listening skills. OK, yeah, so your eyes went up on that. Um, so we're, um, you know, 2008, the presidential election, there was a lot of talk about let's come together. And for a lot of people, we're a little bit farther apart now. So here's this age where we're connected and it's social media and it's wonderful and everybody's being open and sharing and yet, you know, some of this divisiveness is getting worse. Mm -hmm. what, ab what about compassionate listening skills do you think could actually, where does that play a role? I, I think it's so important and it doesn't, we don't create opportunities for us to practice uh, compassionate listening enough. Be, and I'll tell you why. I think because we create these echo chambers for ourselves where we surround ourselves by people who feel the same way that we do, right? So if you're trying to solve a problem, you know, Diane's going to bring together the 10 people in Seattle who she knows do great work and who she's quite fond of, right? If we're trying to solve a problem, we should actually bring together the 10 people who you would hate to be stuck in an elevator with, <laughs> right? Because if all of you together can create a solution, then that is what success looks like. And that's where you need to, you know, practice compassionate listening. And um, I think the other challenge, especially for this generation, but for everyone, given the pulls on our time and our energy, is just being present, right? Mm -hmm. Like We being, were talking about this yeah, before, yeah. Uh, and Monica and I are both like a complete, a completely addicted to our phones. Uh, but, but the need to really hear people and be present in, in situations and in conversations, I think, is, is becoming a lost art form. And mm -hmm. I think, I hope, um, you know, I try and try and model it more when I realize that I'm, I've, I've not looked at my husband for like the six sentences <laughs> he just said. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think that that's hopefully gonna, gonna continue to happen. And what do you think that, what are the things that individuals, what are the steps individuals can take to start moving in those good directions? Um, we've been talking a lot about, you know, mobilization and the millennials as, as a generation, as a big block. Um, you know, and it can be very easy to keep it all on the side of, well, the systems need to be better, and the cultures need to be better, and the campaigns need to do better work. But at some point, there's obviously individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what does everyone in this room need to know about civic engagement? How important it is in their lives? How they know they're doing a good job? Uh, yeah. How they know they can have an impact? That's a broad one, but yeah. go ahead so and start the, wherever you want. So the two. Um, two indicators that I was shocked by in the National Conference on Citizenship Civic Health Index that showed, um, that sort of uh, foreshadowed community engagement was if you ate dinner together as a family. People who ate mm -hmm. dinner together as a family were significant percentage points more engaged in their community. Mm -hmm. The second were people who talked to their neighbors, right? So those are just two really basic things. Um, we were, I, I had an interesting Thanksgiving conversation where we were talking about what the, what the biggest obstacle to civic engagement has been in the 21st century. And we were talking about, oh, cell phones and technology, and my brother-in-law said, garage door openers. What? And we were like, tell yeah. us, Darren, what are you talking about? And he was like, in a world where you would need to park outside, wave to your neighbor, go get your mail, talk about the mm -hmm. day, address, you know, the lawnmower that was broken or the piece of election lit that was on your doorstep, you now just press a button and go into your home, mm. right? And you don't have to engage with anyone else. Mm. And so the steps that I would suggest is like, just look up from your computer every once in a while, you know? I, I walk around Seattle and I have my Blackberry 
and I'm talking to people in DC. I have my friends on Facebook from San Francisco. All the while, Seattle is happening all around me, mm -hmm. right? And so I think those two things about valuing human interaction and making the time to talk to people, I think those are uh, one of the most basic things. I was in, pr in preparation um, for these interviews this week. I was like, I can read all the studies and I have an impressive ability to regurgitate statistics. But I was at Tully's Coffee in my hotel and I was just talking to the women that worked there and I was like, tell me what the biggest challenges facing young people in Seattle are. And we got in this great conversation about the tuition cool. rates um, and the increase in tuition at UW and all of these issues that they were facing. And right, no study could have told me that, right? It was only through human interaction that I got a sense of what the challenges of the young people in Seattle Mm -hmm. um, they were facing. And so those are the two things that I would say. And then I think there's, um, there's a lot of resources to help boast that, but human interaction is sort of at the, at the core. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think of, I feel like when I'm with my phone, I'm connected to my world. Yeah. And my world comes with me. My world has nothing to do with the space I'm in. So it's interesting to me, for example, that I mean, in an urban setting, in a city, you know, when I ride the bus, I am so close physically to so many people, but I could not be more distant, mm -hmm. you know, because everyone's plugged into their world, not our world. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's an interesting idea of this, this sense of being present. But it's funny because, I mean, it, at the same time, they might be on their phones connecting with people who believe in a cause that might change things. Yeah. So it's like, how do you know? How do you know which, which level of connection is actually more important? So, so tell me about that. I mean, when it comes to your local, the impact you can have on your local on your neighborhood, for example, versus always staying up on the issue that's happening nationally. Is there a difference there? Is there, would you say, you know, would you say to the person who's very involved in the national cause, you're really not doing it all until you get involved locally? Or do you think it's really whatever you like? I think, it, I think it's the, the most important thing is the passion that you have for an issue, mm -hmm. right? And so I, I believe that a lot of the challenges that this generation faces are being addressed not by who's president, but by locally, who's mm -hmm. on their school board, who's their mayor. And so I would say this is why we need to get engaged locally, right? But for so many people, the national issues and Occupy Wall Street or the genocide in Darfur, like that's, that's what's getting them in mm -hmm. to activism. And so which, from whichever way you come, whether it's online or offline or, you know, uh, one of our staff members, uh, you know, held a sign for uh, Mayor Dinkins in New York when she was four with her family, right? And so whether you come to activism on your own or through your family, like where, wherever you enter, like we, we want you there. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, that that's the most important thing we can say. I think we live in a really interesting time where, I mean, just even a decade or two ago, on, offline organizing was enough, right? It was mm -hmm. enough to make change. It was enough to, to get someone elected. It was enough to pass a bill, and it's not anymore, right? We live in this world where online and offline organizing and all the tools associated with that are just are in the toolbox, right, mm -hmm. that we have at our disposal. And, and both, it's, it's not an either or. I think it's a both and. Mm -hmm. So let's say it's somebody in this room has, a, has something they are incredibly passionate about and they really want to get the word out and they want other people to listen and to hopefully join in. What steps do you take in today's world to make that happen? Great, well obviously you come to mobilize.org. Okay. Um, but, uh, no, I, I could just end there. It's worth <laughs> end on, but I think, um, so it depends what kind of change you want to make. We saw an unbelievable campaign just a couple of weeks ago by a young woman who was fed up about the debit card fees that Bank of America was proposing, oh, yeah. right? She didn't call her elected official, not that that's not valuable. She didn't go and take a meeting with Bank of America, not that that's not valuable. She used change.org, which is this amazing community building platform to start a petition that got tens of thousands of signatures of people who were not pleased with this. And what resulted from her work and from the national attention that her work got was Bank of America stepped back and said, we won't, we won't actually charge the fees. I didn't realize it was, it's really one person's yeah. kind of. Yeah, wow. okay. uh, and, 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 and right, in every, in every win, there's a confluence of events that happens, mm -hmm. but I think really this ability to self-organize and have the tools to do it, I think that's one example of a, a person who saw something that they wanted to change in their communities. I think Mobilize invested in this amazing organization called Team Rubicon, and they're a group of veterans who 
bridge the time between when a disaster strikes and when international agencies can mobilize to get to these disaster uh, stricken places. And so they're, they're four Marines from, um, and when they left their service, they were sitting on their respective couches around the country and they were watching the devastation in Haiti and they realized that they could be there and they could save lives. And so they called the Red Cross and said, listen, we have these skills, we have this training, let us help you. And the Red Cross told them to make a donation. And they were really mm -hmm. frustrated by that. And so they created this organization of these rapid response teams of veterans who can continue their service after they've left the military in places that need it the most. And they've been in Burma, and they've been in Pakistan, and they've been in Chile, and most recently in Joplin, Missouri. And so I think th those are just two examples of people who saw something that needed to change and used sort of what was closest to them, the mm -hmm. thing they thought of first. So there's not like a step-by-step -step guide, like, y you know, you care about an issue, so then do this, and then this, and then this. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, uh, we have so many tools at our disposal that, 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 that I think that's, that's one of the best things. And so many of them are so accessible. Yeah. You know, you think about, I mean, I think about the, the transition in media where you had to take out a piece of paper, write a letter, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, hope it gets to the editor, and the editor says, yeah, we'll run it. And now, you know, how much easier it is to just get your voice out there and get things started. It is, it is really impressive. How important do you think it is that people be web savvy? Is that just critical these days? There's just no, there's no, I would nothing argue around yes. that. I, I think it's just, it's the way we communicate and it's, uh, it's just a necessity. And for those people who aren't as web savvy, there's so many resources to help. Right, we're, we're creating technology at your fingertips in so many different ways and in so many different formats that, I, I, you know, I don't know how to code. I don't know how to sync my Google Calendar to my Blackberry, right? Like I'm probably one of the most untech savvy millennials there are, but there is this basic competency that you need to have in order to communicate in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think what the fastest growing demographic on Facebook is women 44 to 55, hmm. right? So, so it's not, everybody is web savvy in these days. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. And do you know off the top of your head, what is the statistic for millennials on social media? Isn't it like 75 or 70% have network, have yeah, a have profile? Yeah, at least one profile. At least one profile, okay. Um, so switching gears a little bit again, you've been here in Seattle a couple days. By the way, I didn't ask you, is this your first time in Seattle? It's not, but it's my first time with rain in Seattle. I've always had beautiful what? weather. I know, right? How did you manage that? I know. I've been, I think it's like my fourth or fifth time, and wow. I always get there, and it's like, it's like stunningly beautiful. And someone right. will say to me, oh, this is, you know, this is what we tell the tourists, so right. they stay away. Yeah, it is. Uh, but it's, everyone always says that, so you guys have your like, messaging really, really good, <laughs> uh, really figured out. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, no, this is this is not my first time in Seattle, but Seattle is one of my favorite cities. What do you think of the character of Seattle when it comes to civic engagement, mobilization, the way that young people move and shift here, and really all generations, um, you know, versus maybe the personality or character of other cities? And I'll, I'll cite, I, I guess, as a figure that Rock the Vote has a voting system scorecard, and Washington State ranks number one yeah. of all the states. Um, so, but I'm sure that doesn't mean that we are just the best and we shouldn't worry, we should just sit back. What's your take on it? No, I would say that it does, certainly doesn't mean you need to sit back, but I do think you should applaud yourselves for the high levels of civic engagement and civic health in Seattle, and I think, I think there's a lot of um, factors for that. I think it's the entrepreneurial culture that's created here for mm -hmm. young people. I think it's the, I mean, if you look at, um, the, the companies that are based here, uh, the, the culture of corporate citizenship, of giving back. I think it's a value that's entrenched in many Seattle and Washington institutions. Mm -hmm. And as Boeing was one of the sponsors of this, right? They're always sponsoring City Club. So yeah, you yeah. do see Microsoft, Boeing, and so I think companies. So Seattle, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is number two right on the Civic Health Index. So of the, <laughs> of the largest, 51 largest MSAs in the country, Seattle's the second most civically healthy, vibrant community. What's number one? Minneapolis. Really? And I would, uh, it's, and it's interesting. Let's beat them. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there's an awesome, awesome work that the Seattle City Club is doing, this competition between the two cities to see hmm. why, what lessons we can learn from each other. So I'm excited to see that Seattle's not l resting on their laurels mm -hmm. and really trying to get to be number one. And I don't see there's an, and I'm in Seattle, so I think you're number one in my book. Um, <laughs> but so, so I think, um, 
I think there's some amazing examples of innovation, of creativity, of, of cross-sectoral partnership that's happening here. And so everyone has a lot to learn from the work that's being done in Seattle. How can we, how can we do more? How can we get the word out maybe? Like what would it take for that to happen, for people to learn those lessons? I mean, what do you think could be a step? Yeah, so I think, I mean, first and foremost, I think supporting the work of the Seattle City Club, having more of these conversations, bringing, um, bringing people like you to these amazing national conferences where you can talk about the work that's happening in Seattle. So I think um, finding these, uh, tapping into these national megaphones about uh, why Seattle's so great. I think it's interesting, both Minneapolis and Seattle, in terms of the NCOC ranking, are like the best kept secrets, right? Because mm. you're not these like overly boastful. Like you hear Miami complaining all the time because they're at the bottom. Wait, what was that ranking? N N O C. N C O C, the National Conference on Citizenship. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think uh, I think you're 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 not being boastful, and that's a great thing. But I think mm. being part of these national conversations around how to improve civic education, how to address uh, you know the dropout crisis, all of these things that there's important lessons in Washington State promoting those nationally and I'm happy to you know take what I've learned here take it back to where I am and, and the conferences that I attend and, mm -hmm. and tell the story of Seattle cool and have you seen other have you heard of other organizations or things that you know are active in the local in this area that you would recommend people check out yeah, so Seattle Works, I believe they're here, um, and they're an amazing organization. Um, and, and then I would just give another plug again for the Seattle City Club, and I think uh, I, as a, as a grateful grantee of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I think the work that the Gates Foundation is funding statewide, uh, some, they have some of the most impressive grantees in the work of post-secondary success. The community mm -hmm. college system here is really impressive and doing great work, and so um, I, I've, I also have also done some work with the Starbucks Youth Innovation Fund, and they just today released a new list of 19 investments that they've made, which are young people from all over that, that are doing such important work to improve their communities and their environment. And so I applaud all of those organizations. Okay. And with that, we'll turn it to you guys. Um, there's a lot of places I think we could go. Um, I mean, we've talked about from everything from like politics to just engagement to millennials. But what are you curious about? Who's got a question? We actually have one question from Twitter. Fabulous. <laughs> Great. Um, and they would like to know how have philanthropy found and foundations reacted to and supported millennial-led organizations and entrepreneurs? That's a great question. I think uh, I think philanthropy has been really receptive of this new generation uh, of entrepreneurs. I think um, that f one of the characteristics of this generation has been they've they've been less risk averse, and I think we're pushing philanthropy and traditional institutions that uh, often move slower mm -hmm. and take longer to rethink the impact that they're having and the work that they're doing. And so, Mobilize is fortunate enough to be supported. Uh, in large part by foundations, and we view those funders really as partners, and I've been excited to see how open they are to talk about challenges, how open they are to change direction, and I think, I, I don't want to take credit for our generation for that, but I think they've pushed that change a great deal. And I think the rise of the individual donor, right, the empowerment of young people with small donations in the political process to causes, um, you know, I. I one of my favorite Facebook applications is Causes on Facebook that empowers people to, to, do f to, to create fundraising engines around issues that they care about, engaging their Facebook friends. And they've raised tens of millions of dollars for hundreds of thousands of causes all over the world. And that, that's an amazing example of how this generation is, is reimagining philanthropy. Cool. Nathan? Hi there, my name's Nathan. Thanks for coming here um, to Seattle. My question is, this microphone's really loud. <laughs> I wanted to know what you thought about the millennial generation's view of politics and of Washington and view of the hyper-partisanship that's going on. So as the millennials kind of come, age, come of age as citizens and as citizen leaders, how do you think that's affecting their outlook? Interesting question. So uh, congressional ratings uh, are the lowest that they've been. Congressional approval ratings are the lowest they've been since they started taking approval ratings. Mm. Uh, and so young people are definitely disillusioned by the partisan bickering and the, um, the, the, the conversations that are happening in DC. And 
what I think we're seeing is a turn towards more community engagement, uh, higher volunteering rates, higher civic engagement rates, and perhaps uh, I, I hope it adds, leads to more young people running for office. And so I think that that's what we're going to see because more and more young people are saying that these people in Washington don't represent their interests, aren't taking care of the, the, the problems that they want solved. And so I think we're going to see a, a number of really impressive young people, some of whom I know, uh, particularly from Seattle, you have some amazing young people getting ready to run for office that I don't want to blow up their spot right now. But uh, um, so that's what I think is going to happen, and I'm really, I'm really excited for that. Great. Thank you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned that, uh, like, as an example, that your, your parents, they, they had about two jobs in their lifetime, and, and now we're, as millennials, we're expected to have 17 or more jobs. Um, and so what came to mind was that that, that sense of community is um, – maybe watered down a little bit because of that. Um, would you think that it's actually the opposite, that there's just much more to be involved with, or, um, or yeah, or if it's more yeah. watered down? I think that's a great question. I think there's many more communities. I don't think they're any less intense because of the number of them. Um, so I think, uh, I, I think you're right to say that it's the inverse. There's more communities, there's deeper connections, and, uh, and, and more, and stronger relational ties across different life experiences. So, you know, I'm, I'm 28 and I've had three jobs, six and a half years here at Mobilize and then Rock the Vote in the National Hip Hop Political Convention uh, as well. And so I have strong personal networks from each of those places and um, imagine that I'll continue to have those for the rest of my life. And so I'm not sure how many more jobs I'll have, but I'll continue to invest in people and those relationships in the same way that I have and encourage you to do the same. Thank you. Are you a student here at UW? Uh, yes. What are you studying? Um, I'm studying physics. Oh, awesome. So awesome. Whoosh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't mean to no, uh, hog the mic, um, but I find it's actually kind of hard to be involved with, I guess, um, the social aspect mm -hmm. and being such a, like, you know, heads, like, head down yeah. in like, the, the science. Um, and I guess I, I feel like... Uh, when I do lift my head up, um, there's just so much to be involved with. I, it's kind of overwhelming in a sense, and there's so many groups and like causes that I'd like to, you know, you know, like on Facebook or or support. Um, but I feel myself getting a little spread thin. Um, that with you know, uh, you also gave the example that a lot more millennials are economically responsible for their parents, and so I feel like there's a lot of responsibility kind of you know, shoved onto um, like this generation mm -hmm. and not really uh, not we don't have that many tools to kind of just say okay yeah look, I, we can shoulder all of this like a filter who relates to that I totally relate <laughs> yeah and I, I think that's a, a really profound point but I think what I'll what I'll say from our personal experience is they keep putting it on us and you keep being okay right <laughs> like somehow we just keep being okay uh, and, and that's, and I'm not saying that flippantly because there's a lot of people in this generation that are not okay, right, that are really struggling. But um, I think that, I, I think that the ability, f I think we rely in, in, at least I do, in a great deal on the networks that I have, right, when I have those challenges. Th it's those people around me, it's those Facebook friends, right, that people are like, you know, so dismissive of that help me get through and help me filter those things, right? So there's, I get, a hundred Facebook invitations to events every day, but then if I see that 21 of my friends are coming to this speech at UW, I'm like, well, that's, that's probably worth going. So I allow my network to filter for me. I think the second piece, though, and th this is a staggering, or this is something that I was really struck by. In this country, there's 10 to 20,000 people that are afflicted by brain cancer. There's 125 nonprofits in this country whose mission is to eradicate brain cancer. Right, so like, what does that say about the redundancy and duplicative nature of the nonprofit sector sometimes? Mm -hmm. And so what I think we're seeing right now is a uh, um, is sort of a backlash against this entrepreneurial spirit of everyone needs to start their own thing, and we're seeing people. Mobilize, for example, has acquired eight other organizations, and so we've sort of collapsed uh, the missions and impacts of some nonprofits to give people 
uh, something to, to hold on to instead of saying, here's eight different organizations with three words different in their mission statement. Here's the organization that's hoping to have a positive impact on the millennial generation. Come join us in this movement. It's not about a brand. It's not about a person. It's not about an organization, but it's this movement that you can be part of. And so I think we'll see an increasing amount of that to hopefully reduce the, the amount of information that you need to filter. But thank you for sharing that, and I think you're, you're completely right. Yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could comment on kind of media control issues like um, net neutrality and um, the Eli, um, who can't read part Parisner, who wrote the Filter Bubble book, um, and media conglomerates, um, and whether, you know, what your thoughts are about it, whether you think people have visibility into those issues, um, and what to do about it. So I think that's great. And I think probably you're the expert. On oh, on that. kind of media owners. Yeah. Oh my gosh, it's such a complicated, it's just amazing what's happened. I mean, on, on the one hand, it's the publishing revolution. Everybody has their voice. Anybody can put up a blog. You know, it's the end of the big media companies, right? Well, no, because you still see, you know, that money has a lot of power, despite the fact that we're all so liberated to share our voice. Um, and not to mention that there's a lot of forces online. I mean, we we're talking about the divisiveness of politics. I mean, you know, we each of us are guilty of wanting to hear, um, preferring to want to hear from people who agree with us. So these media organizations that speak in narrative and speak emotion really do well, you know, and that's a little unfortunate if you look at it very objectively, but it's understandable because it's human nature. Um, anger really motivates. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll turn it over to you. I think it, it's, it's been the same problem that we've talked about for decades with, with media ownership and with, with um, a lot of power being concentrated uh, in, in, in the small group. But, but the way they, what is that saying? You know, never, never something, uh, anyone who buys ink by the barrel. And, and that really isn't quite the same now because really people can have power if, they're, if they really have, you know, the woman who brought down that policy at Bank of America. Um, so that's, that's my comment on it, but I'll turn it to you. Yeah, so I, I definitely think it's an issue, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of young people, particularly so the examples that I know are related to the Sunlight Foundation and the work that the Omidyar's uh, network is doing to open up access, to make data more available, to talk about the access to broadband. So this definitely is an issue, and I think um, will we'll continue to be even more so of one, as Monica says, the, the sort of culture shifts around the availability and production of media. Thanks. Okay, and I guess, um, do, we, do we have time for a little more discussion or should I wrap it up? Um, I did want to get to the upcoming presidential election and I'll just confess that I kind of want to hide under a rock. I kind of want to disappear. I mean, I like being engaged, you know, I want to be a good citizen, that's all great, but each, seems to me that each presidential election becomes more and more theatrical. There's more of a circus. You know, there's always one side blaming the other, that they're the ones really, you know, they're the reason we're so, just can't get anything done. No, it's them. But it's all, I mean, it's the same damn thing every time with just, it's just a circus. And, it, and you get really tired of it. So, you know, but here come the millennials, here comes this, you know, generation of hope and new activism. Here's, here's social media, here's people, here's authentic voices, here's new causes, here's one person being able to make a difference in a whole new way. But, ah, but I can get discouraged sometimes. What, what do you anticipate is going to happen in 2012? So I, and I was asked that question at lunch, and I think the millennials are going to come out big in the way that they did in 2008. In 2008, this generation represented 80% of the margin of, of victory for President Obama. Um, between 2008 and when the voter deadline, or the voter registration deadline is for the 2012 election, 16 million more millennials will have come to age mm. and turned 18, right? So the big voting block just got a whole lot bigger. Wow. Uh, and so I think that's a really, that's a huge potential uh, for engagement and, and to tap into. I think that what we'll see, I think 2008 was a very identity-driven election, right? This hope and change piece. I think the 2012 election is going to be an urgent, an, an urgent and, and important election for millennials. They're not going to have 
um, you know, not that they're going to lose their idealism, but they're going to take this in a way where it's like, what are you going to do about these issues that I'm facing every day? How are you going to improve my life? And I hope that they're going to hold the candidates to task in this next year to make some really substantive commitments to the challenges that these young people are facing. But my prediction, and I, I am... I'm doing my best to make it happen is that young people will sort of match, if not exceed, the record number of, out of voter turnout that we saw in the 2008 election. Mm -hmm. And, and some, some would say that the 2008 election was really unique because of the, that surge of emotion, that positive sort of emotion, but we're going through a really icky political time. I mean, are you concerned that people are just not going to go to the polls as much because they're not feeling it? They're not feeling it anymore. Yeah, I, I mean, d it's definitely a concern, but I think, um, again, I think that there's not an option of inaction right now, mm -hmm. right, given the challenges that are being faced. There, we need to push our national dialogue, our elected officials, to take action on improving the condition of millennials in this country, and, and I would say it goes far beyond millennials. And so I think, um, I think when it comes to election day 2012, people are going to show up, they're going to show up big, and it's going to be an important day in our history. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, Maya. This was a really great conversation. Thanks to all of you for, you know, for coming, for asking your questions, and uh, yeah, thanks to City Club, and yeah, <laughs> another thanks. And Monica, <laughs> thanks to you.